yeah, you just like theory one over two.
when you, you have a request and response right, in the browser, and you're sending some data with a request, where you, you fill out the form on the web page and click the submit button. Right? The data goes to the browser, the browser responds with the response, and the data that you sent to the request goes directly to the response without any validation. There are a few seats up here, you guys. There's one, two, three, three, one, two, two seats in front of And so that's why it's called reflected, because you get the response with the payload right away. So how that works in the real world, how the attackers actually exploit it, well, they create a link that says get the trust with the payload and the URL. The user clicks on the link and the user gets the phishing email. The script loads into the vulnerable website, your bank.com, whatever. The script executes within the browser, and because now the script browser trust the script because the script actually came from the response from main.com but you didn't know that it actually came from the attacker from somewhere else. So the browser trusts it, the script, executes it, and the script can get access to your cookies, to your sensitive data, to your account information, all the bad stuff. Stored process scripting, it's not executed right away. It is being stored somewhere in the database, in the file, somewhere in the server for some time. So for example, it's your you know, profile update page. So somebody is filling out a profile, say this is an HR system you know, at your company, your local internal HR system. You know, a new employee or like intern or contractor fills out the information about himself and instead of putting the address with some malicious process scripting, Saves that that is being saved in the database. When this employer reviews the page, the script can be executed, but the script attacks the same person, right? So there is no gain. Well, you attack yourself. So you're not sending it to somebody else. You only can store it in your own profile. Well, a couple of months later, next week, your HR director is reviewing the form, you know, the, the applications of all the employees, their, their personal information. And the HR director is reviewing this page. The script is executed now with the HR director's privileges. Because the script was stayed, um, stored in the database. And now the script can store the HR director's cookie and send it to the malicious employee. And the, he can get access to like, all the salaries and all the personal information in the company. So that's your story. So DOM based, and, and these two have been known for a long time, and we kind of maybe know how to fix them because we can do input validation and output encoding on the server side. All good. Well, DOM based does not happen on the server side. This whole thing is happening in the browser. And that's when you get your heavy JavaScript applications with your AngularJS, you know, um, jQuery, all the JavaScript libraries again. Everything is happening on the in the browser on one page or single page applications. So the user puts some input or you know gets it in the in the URL, the JavaScript grabs this input, does some integrations, and then this input becomes part of the page. It's reflected on the same page in a different window, iframe, whatever. But this payload didn't even travel to the server. It's all happening in the in the, in the client side in the browser. That means even if you have your input validation on the server, you have your output encoding on the server, you're still vulnerable to DOM based because the server is not going to catch it. Into the mic closers. Okay. <laughs> uh, Alright. All right, so, how do we deal with that? So we deal with input validation. All good, but what's the problem with it? Well, you know, first we have blacklists that are not actually working because you can always bypass it, then you can you forget one place, you forget you, you know, you secure all your pages and then you forget your search functionality. And that's it, that's only takes you know, one 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 weakest link and your application is busted. Output encoding? Great. What is the problem with output encoding? Well, well output encoding has to be context aware, right? You have to know which, in, into which context are you writing? Are you writing this as a URL parameter in your um, HTML tag, this is your source parameter? Are you writing that into HTML attribute? Are you writing that straight into your HTML? Are you writing that into JavaScript? Those all different contexts will require different types of encoding. 
engineer and you need to know, your developer needs to know where your output will be. So you screw it up one time, or you do double encoding because maybe you encode in one place in the application and then you have something on top of the application, some kind of filter that also doesn't go in. And then you have double encoded data, and that, which means attacker can bypass your some kind of encoding and you know, basically trick your application because it's not performing how it's supposed to. And then, yeah. Leave and closer, okay. That's, now I feel like, you know, I'm on the Oscar nomination. <laughs> straight into the mic, wow, all right. So DOM-based process scripting, we're not going to be able to fix it with our input validation and output encoding on the server. You can do that on the client, you can do input validation on the client, you can do output encoding on the client. It's possible, it's cumbersome, and again, with a lot of JavaScript, it's, it's just hard to implement, right? So, what do we have here? Yeah, right now, there's always a way. <laughs> Like you can always bypass it and you can like encode into encode into something else or whatever and you can always find a way to break it. So let's look at a couple examples of how do we actually how, how the exploit can work. Right. So this is our you know, typical GSP application. We get the input from the get request and we write it out straight into the HTML. So what an attacker can send is can the attacker can send a couple script tags and JavaScript within it. And then as a result, we get this JavaScript immediately in our page. So that is our inline JavaScript. Right? The browser parses the HTML, sees those scripts, and executes whatever, whatever, whatever there is in between the script tags. So then we have, we can also use a third party JavaScript injection. <coughs> so instead of sending the actual JavaScript, you know, the, the, server, the server code is the same, but instead of sending the script, we're just sending the JavaScript linked to the JavaScript file, which is hosted somewhere else. And again, the browser will execute it, even though the script is coming from attacker.com, you know, not from bang.com, but our same origin policy will not protect us here, because that's how the browsers are built. You know, we're using JavaScript libraries from everywhere, so the script tag is actually an exception from the same origin policy. It allows to download data from somewhere else, the script becomes part of your page, it's executed, it's in your context, has access to everything. Alright, and then we have, so that's an example of DOM base, right? Things like evals, things like document that write, when you are creating JavaScript on the fly, right? In this case, we are taking input from the element called parameter, and then creating a calling a function and sending that value of that parameter into the function and evaluating the JavaScript, right? The, the, the text within. So in this case the injection goes straight into the JavaScript context. Somebody sending you know alert dot alert XSS or whatever other JavaScript, it becomes part of the whatever that eval is evaluating and executing. So in this case nothing is going to the server. As you can see this is all happening in the browser. That's, that's your DOM base. And the browser doesn't know what, what payload was expected. Was, it, you know, was there something executable expected at all? Was there a string expected? Where it's coming from? It cannot evaluate if that's safe or not. So that's why we're coming to a new solution. So obviously, input validation, output encoding doesn't work, doesn't, well, it works, but it doesn't solve the problem 100%. So coming out with a new solution called the security policy, what it does is a combination of the server protection and the browser protection. So the server basically says, we are establishing the following policy. You can download images from these domains, scripts from these domains, fonts from these domains. So for all your resources, you specify where you can download them. So these are the safe domains. These are the same sources, safe, um, safe locations. And then the browser, when it gets this policy, downloads the page and parses the page and looks at every resource and says, oh, okay, this is an image, it's coming from there, and you know, evaluates the policy, can I, can I actually load this image? Yes or no. This is the script, it's coming from there, from attacker.com. Is attacker.com on my white list of allowed domains? Yes or no. So for each resource. And you know, in, the, in the example here, you can have JavaScript in many different places on the page, right? It can be coming from your plugins, 
It can be your inline JavaScript, it can be within your iframe, it can be third-party libraries, so there are a ton of places, different attack vectors on your web page that can be vulnerable. Right? And with a, with a policy, you kind of create this one white list of what can come in, what cannot come in, what I trust, what I don't trust. Okay, so how does it work? So that's an HTTP header where you specify the policy. And if the browser supports it, that's great. If the browser does not support it, you just go back to same origin policy and whatever is in the same origin is allowed, you know, kind of nothing breaks, right? If the browser does not support it. So, in this case we have a directive for script and we say we can load scripts from self, which is you know, from our domain, and from APIs Google.com. So suppose the page is trying to load an image from bbc.com, www.bbc.com. And we have a content security policy that says set default source to self and to star.mydomain.com and set image source to a star. So what do you think? Will the page be able to load the image? Yeah. Because yeah. we say load the images from everywhere. All good. How about this one? No. All right. So, because we have default source set to self and start my domain. So, default specifies the default policy for all the different. Uh, keywords that are not specified. In this case, we don't have the exact script source, so the script source will fall into default and say we can only download scripts from ourselves or from mindomain.com. So attacker.com is not in the list. No. And how about this one? We're talking about CSS. The, the keyword for the CSS is style source. Yes, because we don't have the style source in the list. We don't have default, and by default, the default is open with everything. So if you don't specify default, you say, oh, you, know, you can load everything from everywhere. So in this case, we're only um, restricting the scripts, the iframes, and the objects, so your um, plugins. So when you write your secu uh, home security policy, when you define the policy, it's not just the scripts that you need to load. You also need to think about the frames, which those are the iframes that can be loaded into your, into your app. Uh, think about the objects, if the plugins, if the attack can also come from there. If you are using web sockets, you will um, specify the connect source that's uh, establishing for web sockets and um, the um, yeah, XHR, the XML HR request, so the Ajax communication. Okay. Another good quality about CSP is that if some script or some resource is trying to be loaded with, you know, and it violates the policy, you can get a violation report to your server. So to do that, you specify the report URI, whatever, you know, your, some kind of parser application on your backend that will be getting those JSON format, formatted reports, and you will see, okay, where the attack is coming from, if this is an attack, right? Maybe it's just a, well, now it's going to be a bug in your application where you're trying to load the images from somewhere, but you didn't specify that resource in your policy. So you're going to see, okay, what is the blocked URI? So where, what is the resource? Which policy it's violating? And um, the, origin, the original policy that you have. So this is a great monitoring tool. First, when you're trying to deploy a content security policy to see how your policy actually works or doesn't work, what, what kind of resources are breaking your policy, and then when you have it configured to track if you're being attacked or not. However, one thing to remember is that unfortunately the browsers have different formats of the reports. So Chrome and Firefox and Opera will have slightly different formats. You know, the, the, the attribute names will be different. For, so for example, Firefox, for a blocked URI, will give you the full URL and will say, okay, this is the name of the JavaScript, you know, in this case, like, evil.js, where Chrome will only give you the domain name. It will say, you know, coming from evil.example.com, that's it. So I'm going to give you the full path, the full 
filing. So something to keep in mind. And tomorrow, actually, we have another talk. Stuart Larson, I think, right? <laughs> Talking about one of the tools that you can use for reporting Casper. Yeah. When you're starting to implement content security policy, basically, you know, you write your first policy, and what will probably happen is your application is going to break. Because you probably didn't specify, unless you say, you know, default star and allow everything. Once you start locking down the security, something will break, something will stop working. So, not to do that to your application, what you can do, you can also use um, report only functionality. So, in this case, you write your policy, any violation you will get a report, but the browser will still allow the resources. So, in this case, you will say, oh, okay, so I specified. Um, for example, and you can actually use both of them. So you start with a more open policy, you say, oh, default is set the source, and start at google.com or just star, and then in your report only, you say only allow these, for, like for script, only allow the APIs uh, that google.com, so not start at google.com. So if you have a resource that's coming from a different subdomain of Google, you are going to get the report, the violation report, but the resource will still load and your website will still work. So that's a kind of stepping stone for when you're starting to implement the CSP. So, you know, writing HTTP header with some policy is not that hard. What's hard is to change your JavaScript code. Because what CSP does by default, which I haven't mentioned yet, is it disallows the use of any inline script. It disallows use of um, event handlers, like the way we use, the way we usually use, you know, your on click, on mouse, over everything. Uh, this allows the use of eval and eval similar to eval constructs like set timer um, or the, the function, you know, writing out the JavaScript function. So, what are you going to do with your JavaScript? So, you know, simple example: we have some script, we have some functions. So we have the, the set timeout function is an eval construct because in the set timeout you can see a string that's going to be evaluated and after every timeout of a thousand milliseconds it's going to run this console.log and then the repeated function, right? So that's basically your eval right there. And we have some events. So first we create a JavaScript and externalize all our JavaScript into the page. So we move our the repeated function we create the repeated task function out of, out of our eval construct because you cannot use eval, that's going to break, you know, init function and then since you cannot use the regular on-click event, events, event handlers, what you need to do is you need to create a listener for every event. So when the form loads, you say, you know, the DOM content loaded, you select your button and add an event listener for the on-click event and all the other events that you need run your init function. And then your HTML page is going to look like this. All you do is you import one JavaScript and you make sure you allow it in your content security policy, in this case it's you know, coming from self, so it's local, and that's it. So, how hard is it to do that? For developers, I guess. It is hard. I mean, it's one page, right? But think about your application you have to rewrite the whole application, you have to externalize everything. How do you debug that stuff? Well, it's in the it's, libraries. It's a, yeah, it's all in the libraries, and it's just hard to find, okay, which one, this, you know, the button, when I click, which function is being called, you go back to the JavaScript, oh, this function is being called. In which JavaScript is this one? It's, it's a nightmare, it's like rewriting. If you start writing application from scratch, and you say, I'm going to write code like this, then yes, you know, it will take some training for your developers, and that's doable. But to rewrite the existing application that is already in production. That's very expensive. Let's put it this way. So, what about the support? So, CSP 1.0 is supported by almost all the browsers, except IE has their own. Um, you have to add like, the X content security policy, the X um, prefix to the, uh, to the HTTP header. And Opera Mini does not support it, and I don't think they're going to, but yeah. who uses Opera Mini? Hopefully not too many people. 
some data from 2013, so this, you know, a year old. Um, so Veracode was doing, you know, doing their analysis of all the different HTTP headers that are being used in 10, 100,000 100, websites, right? the, the top 100,000 websites. And out of that 100,000 websites, 269 were using CSV. I mean, this is like less than tenth of a percent. Um, a little bit more, we're using different versions of CSV. So 2013, the standard was not yet supported by all the browsers. There were different, words, like the WebKit had their X WebKit prefix and then CSV, the X CSV for IE. So, but you know, okay, so say about 600 applications total were using uh, CSP for IE. So there was some usage, but of course for 10, 10 hundred websites it's, it's, it's meaningful. Why? Well, we just saw why, because it's so hard to externalize your JavaScript and actually rewrite your application. Another thing is that most of these applications, most of, yeah, most of the applications, so if um, 269 were using the real CSP, 257 out of, that, of them were using CSP with two keywords, unsafe inline and unsafe eval. What does it mean? They're, all, they're still vulnerable, right? Because basically these two keywords allow the execution of eval and allow the inline scripts. It's like, what is the purpose of it at all? <laughs> you're not protecting yourself. Well, maybe you're protecting, oh, I'm only you know, downloading images from these sources, but that's it. If speaking of CS, uh, speaking of cross-site scripting, you're not protected. Today, Twitter is using CSP on all their services, and I wanted to go and see kind of what kind of headers they're actually sending, right? The first header that they're sending, you know, we'll look at the script source, which is interesting for us for um, cross-site scripting, unsafe in line and unsafe in And I saw that, I was like, what? Really? Twitter? So then I looked for the next request. And they sent another um, content security policy header in the couple kind of following requests. And in this case, script source only has one domain, tom.twigmg.com. And that's it. There is no default. There, uh, I mean, there's no self, there's no star, or star anything, you know, so any, any prefix. So basically, Twitter is loading all of its JavaScript from just one place. So they managed to do that. They did externalize all the JavaScript. And it's loading from this different subdomain where they're hosting all the JavaScript. There's no unsafe in line. There is unsafe in line in the style source. And that's your CSP, which is fine, you know, you can, you can have your inline style, style sheets. So they are successful. They made it work, which means it's possible. It's doable, and that's, uh, and that's CSP one. That's not even going to the second version of CSP that is still in um, in drafts. Yelp is also using CSP. So they have one thing that struck me interesting: the default source. They set it to star. It's like okay, by default we allow everything. First, you don't even need to write default source because by default it is. It does allow everything. But okay. Uh, and then the script source, so they have a bunch of different domains, you know, subdomains of Facebook, subdomains of Facebook CDN, um, Google Analytics, and what's interesting, the local host, they allow scripts from local host, so I don't know what is the use for that, or this is some kind of like, um, you know, test feature that went into production. <coughs> Um, oh, okay. Bug in Chrome and on iOS. Interesting. All right. Um, and then, you, of course, they have the unsafe inline and unsafe evolve, unfortunately. So, still not protected from cross site scripting. But it looks like they're, you know, they're making steps, so maybe they'll go. Why do you think they have website are still websites are still using? Unsafe in line. Well, unsafe evolved. Google Analytics. Hmm? Google Analytics. Google Analytics. Basically, basically libraries. Whenever you use Google Analytics or some other JavaScript framework, not all JavaScript frameworks work with CSP. I would say most of them don't. So that's yeah. If you rely on the framework, unfortunately for now, it's, 
you'll have to do that. So that's why we have CSP 1.1, or second version that is still in the working draft as of July 2014, hasn't moved anywhere further in the, um, the approvals to become the actual standard. So they introduced a few interesting features. And the two most interesting for uh, process scripting are the non-source non and hash source uh, two directives. They also have a suggestion to use policies in the meta tags instead of the HTTP headers, or both, or uh, one of them, or another. Can you think of a problem with having your CSP in, as a meta tag, as a tag in your HTML, basically? <coughs> You can, yeah, it can be injected. Because if, if you have your like unsafe inline, well, even if you don't have unsafe inline, you have an injection into HTML, which is not a JavaScript injection, right? So you don't care. And it's a manipulation of your HTML if somebody else injects a meta tag with a very lax policy that means all the other JavaScript they were trying to inject will now be accepted by the browser. So like, uh, maybe not, I don't know. All right, so let's look at the, oh, and it's currently, Currently supported by Firefox from version 31 and Chrome from version 30. With Firefox, it's supported. Um, oh, and with Chrome, you have to enable experimental web features, so it's not supported kind of by default. But so there, the browsers are moving into starting to support that. So what is the nonce directory? Basically, the suggestion was we'll take every JavaScript, every inline JavaScript that you allow in your application and put some kind of nonce, right? some, some kind of token, and then add these tokens to your content security policy. And you say, if this inline JavaScript has the token, the token matches to the policy, I allow execution of this JavaScript. So if the, if the uh, attacker is trying to inject something else, they don't know what's going to be the token. Of course, you need to regenerate the token every time the page loads. So they can't inject that token into the page that is being loaded on the victim's device, on the victim's computer, right? They can look at their own, but not on, on you know, somebody they want to attack. Okay, so that kind of works. You have a couple caveats is that you have to generate new nonce each time. Obviously, they should not be reusable. Uh, it's kind of like the, content, the um, CSRF token, right? Same policies. Unguessable, long enough, renewed every time. Um, one problem is that when people are trying to implement that, what they're going to do is they would put some kind of filter after you generate the request, right? And you put some kind of filter and say, oh, for every JavaScript, generate a nonce and add it to CSV on the server side. Well, if you have a reflective process scripting and somebody is trying to inject a script, so you have your search page, right? In your search top term, somebody is injecting JavaScript, you're outputting that search term in the response with the JavaScript, and then after the page is created, you automatically go through every JavaScript and basically approve it because you attach a nonce to it. So then the attacker's payload will also have a valid nonce. That's not a good idea. So how do you add a nonce in JavaScript? If it's static, then if you're using some kind of templating mechanism, you would go to your template and see all the static JavaScript that you already have there and attach nonces there, right? And whatever dynamic JavaScript is generated, you, since you say, oh, I'm not using inline, then you should not add nonce there. Because whatever inline JavaScript is coming, then it is coming from an, from an attacker. It's malicious. So that's one approach. But what if you generate JavaScript on the fly? Then you cannot use the nonces, right? Uh, they, um, so, yeah. And also the DOM-based. If you already have some JavaScript some, that has a DOM-based vulnerability, as we saw in the beginning, and the attacker is trying to inject more JavaScript in your chunk of inline JavaScript, just inject a couple more functions, well, the JavaScript already has the nonce. So it's already approved by you, and the browser will execute it. So it's not going to help us with a lot of type, types of DOM-based process scripting. So what do we do? Well, we have another favorite solution in security is using the hash, right? Using the hashing. So in this case, we are not just saying, oh, this JavaScript is static, I trust it, here's a nonce. You actually hash the whole JavaScript snippet 
and you get hash. So you kind of sign it and say, yeah, this is this is trusted. And you, you know, take the, the, the chunk of JavaScript, hash it, and then you add the hash to your content security policy header. So in this case, you're going to say, you know, script source, and for every JavaScript piece on that page, you're going to generate a hash, and you say, I'm caching with, you know, say, two, 256, and here is the hash. And the next, and the next, and the next. So your policy will have a bunch of these um, hashes. So what does the browser do? Loads the script, finds every script snippet, does the hashing according to the algorithm that's specified, and validates if the hash matches or not. So, in this case, if the attacker tried to inject something into the already existing JavaScript, what's going to happen? Yep, the hashes will match. The source is different, the hash will be different, so the browser will not execute it, will send a report, and all that. Okay. Uh, what is the problem with that still? Well, it's not, it's not the problem so much with the hash. Well, first you need to generate the hash. Right? And you need to, again, if you, if you are generating dynamic JavaScript, you need to generate it on the server side and then generate the hash. But then if you have the JavaScript, which generating another JavaScript on the client side in the browser and writing out, then you, you're out of luck. You, you, know, you have your one piece of JavaScript that does some calculations and then says, you know, document that write and writes more JavaScript. Well, that other JavaScript is not going to have a hash because it's not coming from the server. So it's still mm, not ideal. Another problem, or not, not a problem, but another aspect of that. Okay, we just didn't allow the inline scripts, but we have not allowed the, um, the handlers. So even though you have your JavaScript and you have your you know, button on click, you still cannot write button, you know, the attribute on click, and set it to function because the on click, the, the attribute events are still disallowed by the CSP. So you will still have to, on your initiation of the page, you will have to go through all your elements in the page and assign whatever event handlers you want in the JavaScript snippet, but not kind of inside the web page. But, you know, that's, I would say, a small uh, price to pay. It's not as hard. Because then you have to get everything else working. And that's actually it. But uh, I'm willing to take questions. So, just to clarify, when you were talking about the box and the hashing, so those are both things that are only in CSP 1.1? Yes. Okay. So those are both in 1.1. They are supported, both those directives are supported by Firefox and Chrome, you know, the latest version. With Chrome, with the enable experimental features setting, um, and Firefox by default, you don't need to, to enable it. So you can, you can play with them. <laughs> but, you would not, but you would not depend on these things you know, to serve your customer needs, of course. Not for a while. Not, yeah, not for a while. So that, that, that's not the aspect, right? So you enable your CSP, you enable your policy, you externalize your JavaScript, and then you have somebody who's using IE6, right? So in terms of protecting your application from cross-site scripting, you cannot, right, right, at least right now, you still cannot rely on CSP 100% and say, I'm only going to use, you know, hash source and non-source, and that's how I'm going to protect my application from CSP. I'm not going to do input validation, output encoding, or anything else. So unfortunately, it's a, it's a, it's a next step, it's a build up, but we're not there yet to completely rely on that. Yep. Does hash source uh, apply to the inline scripts or uh, evalid scripts as well? So hash source applies to the inline that you have. It's not gonna uh, allow execution of eval, an eval construct, yeah. So you'll have to still use, you know, your Unsafe default directive. So I've seen several talks on uh, CSP, but one thing that people kind of always gloss over is the report URI functionality. What do people do with that? Does like dev know all these things, or do they have to do anything useful? Yep, yep. So that's a great question. So report URI, right? Yeah. Well, first we have a separate talk tomorrow. 
Everybody go steer, uh, listen to Stuart tomorrow. Um, I know Yelp does a great thing. So they uh, aggregate all this data. And so think about it, right? You get the reports of every attack or, or every different file that is your application is trying to load. If you are Yelp, if you are you know, a big application with hundreds and hundreds of users, that's your kind of like I IDP thing in the, in the software, right? Not on the network, but that's your detrusion protection, uh, detrusion identification tool, right? Intrusion identification tool. So you can see where the attacks are coming from, which domains. If they're coming, if they're if they, you know, trying to attack JavaScript, if they're trying to attack um, iframe, iframe injection, so what, what, what kind of injection that, that somebody is trying to do, where the text is coming from, and then you know um, for which page the report is. Um, so you have the document, document to your right, so that's the page that's being attacked. Well, if the page is being attacked, that means the page has a vulnerability. So that's your free testing, that's your free pen testing, you know, that's your <laughs> bounty from the attackers, right? That page has a vulnerability, go fix it. Um, so. so I think you, what I think the question is, would you know that some sort of slump thing is, or some of this group, or what do you gonna, how do most people do that? So how do people do that? The report part so there are a couple of free tools, Casper is one of them, and again, listen to the talk tomorrow. One, one of the tools, so you, I don't, I don't know, if Splunk, I don't think Splunk has a, functionality that will allow you like, to integrate with CSP directly, you'll have to write your own tool to insert those reports in Splunk. But there are free tools that actually work with these reports. And I know Yahoo developed something else in-house, I don't know if they're going to do it, you know, outsource it, or if, if, if the world is going to see their tool. Um, but I think I have a link and to the Yelp. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah, Yelp. <coughs> No, but if you Google up the Yelp CSP, they have a great blog post with like pictures of the dashboard that they're using. You know, so as I said, they didn't release the tool yet, but you can see their dashboard that says, okay, this is how many requests we got on this day from this resource. These are the pages that are mostly vulnerable. Well, these are the names where the requests are coming from. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot of data, a lot of users. Yeah. Uh, two more things. Just on the report functionality. One is that you typically get a lot of noise because users have extensions and they're on ISPs who inject things into your pages. So it's not really attacks going on. Yep. They're getting less uh, unwanted software in their pages, but you've got to filter that out. Mm -hmm. And the second thing I'd like to mention is that in the spec, in, it says that the report should not include the fragment identifier. Which after it in the URL. So if you're building a stateful Ajax application and you're relying on so-called hash bang URLs, you will not get those. Mm -hmm. And so you don't know where in the application they have. Right. If you if you are creating a single page application, your document URI will always be the same place. Mm -hmm. the same, that's one page. Yeah, that's right. That's how it, we'll it, see it, where the attack yeah. yeah. But it, you can do it with pop paths and you, you will at least the Firefox. Yes, and Firefox will, Firefox will get it. And that was interesting, so there was another interesting kind of research piece uh, about how the browsers implement the report, you know, not just the reporting, but also the CSP itself. So, let me find an example here. Okay, so, the way the script source is specified here, they are only specifying the, the origin, right? Facebook.com. They're not going to the which directory, where exactly, what exactly. So Google Chrome will let me don't, don't want to mix them up. So basically one, one of the browsers, Firefox and Google Chrome, one of them allows the CSP very granular law and to go like yes, allow script loaded from not just Facebook.com but slash this folder, slash this folder, slash this folder. And then another will only allow very generic, you can only you know, get if if you allow from Facebook.com that means from any subfolder on Facebook, the scripts can be loaded. So that's another thing that the two browsers implement differently. 
And I think Firefox is implementing it to the standard where Chrome is deviating and I would be interested to hear like why did they do that? Why did they make this decision? But they may also very it's a it's a distinction between CSP level one and two and, and Chrome is already implementing two with PaaS and Firefox nightly or beta might be implementing PaaS but release version isn't. So just, just the origin. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, compliance level with the spec. Okay, all right. So that kind of causes a very interesting thing because um, since Firefox gives you the full URI, it actually can lead to some privacy issues because now the owner of the, of the application, say you know, your Yelp or whatever, Facebook, knows exactly which other URLs you are trying to go to, specifically up to the, you know, the, the file name, where the Google will just say, oh, this user tried to load some files from here, and not, not say exactly which files. So there have been um, interesting attacks on uh, how, Pro, um, how Firefox implements CSP, and you can actually like, get information from the users of basically which pages they have you visited, where they're going, and things like that. So you're always between, okay, we're giving you a lot of security, but now we're learning a little bit more about the user's privacy versus security thing. So the, the, the attack that they used is So, they created a page, hosted somewhere else on, you know, say, attacker.com or whatever, that had an iframe with your login to Facebook screen. So, you click on the page, you know, your Facebook login comes in, and if you are already logged into Facebook, the Facebook will redirect you to your profile page. And so then, in the CSP, they will say, well, only allow going to facebook.com slash login dot whatever, like HP or whatever they do, right? So if your browser is redirecting you to facebook.com slash you know, Ksenia Dmitrieva, that URL will be sent to the site as part of the report because it violated CSP. So now they know, oh, that is this user's profile page. And if it's, you know, not your name, but some, some um, hash, then, you know, you're violating the privacy. So, yeah. If I have Google Analytics on my page, and Google send me this content security policy in the FS, okay. so I'm loading the script with the content security policy, and <coughs> report URI. So will it report everything on my page, or? So you're using Google Analytics. So you're... Um, Loading JavaScript from Google.com from APIs yes. Google.com, but the content security policy you set it yourself. It's not no, Google. Uh, who's uh, the it. Google, like you know, when I download the script, it sends a content security policy. Oh, for, for for Google. Right. For Google. Um, then this content security policy will only work for that JavaScript that you're loading from Google Analytics. So if that JavaScript is trying to load something else from somewhere else, then they're going to send the report <coughs> to Google, but they're not going to see what else you're trying to load on your page and then not going to send to so, yeah, that's, Again, the same origin policy still plays here. Like, okay, this is content security policy for this particular file, for this particular JavaScript or HTML page, but not for everything else outside. So, sorry, you're good. You're safe. <laughs> A little bit. More questions? So, I know some people said that they've been using CSP here. And I would like to hear you guys, um, how did you rewrite your applications to make them work with CSP? Were you successful with that or not? I know you were raising your hand. Well, I was just using it with that WordPress. And I met lots of problems. Just like, like you said, like Google Analytics and Blackberries. Uh, just requires a lot of like time to develop, go back, fix all the little things, and like you have to 
you know, if you like change images, you can only come from, let's say, your own uh, domain, you have to then, I was hosting a lot of images on Photobook and uh, other Flickr, I moved like, all the images to my own website, and just like, all that other stuff, just time and annoying things, uh, yeah. still a thing to that. Okay. Uh, completely doable. So do doable, but time consuming, money consuming, as I said, you were doing it for a personal page, but yeah, if you think of a big corporate website, that's uh, we just simply wanted, wanted a Node.js service, and um, there's a neat library um, for it, which makes it easier. Some of the challenges were um, uh, caching, so if you have like a CDN that caches your page, some of the browsers require like different headers, so you have to set either all of them, or yet you can't cache that page. Um, and then also, yeah, we use recapture and Google Analytics, and both of those require the voice <coughs> directives to work. Okay. So it's still... Doable at some point. Do yeah, it. I mean, we've, we've got a policy and hopefully we can find it over time. Okay. Uh, Ruben and I work for Airbnb. We recently went through all of our pages and turned on uh, report only mode. And it's a great opportunity for us to look back at like some of our earliest JavaScript code and the libraries we were using, especially like the old you know, 2008 jQuery dot, you know, some function dot JS and stuff. And, Take stock of all the really bad code that we reported early in sites like that. Mm -hmm. so, great, so you can use report the, the reporting functionality, right? The report only header to just see what kind of code you're using right now, what, how old it is. Yeah, that, that's, that's not a great tool. Um, <laughs> thought was, oh, so, yeah, the other thing I wanted to say is if somebody came out with a tool that would do this for you, right? Take all of your JavaScript, externalize it into a separate file, and then produce you these two files, you know, clean HTML and separate JavaScript. That would be great. But if you have ever uh, read about like static analysis for JavaScript, which is not doable at the moment, <laughs> that thing is, I don't know, if somebody comes out with this, they're going to make a lot of money. So that would be great. <laughs> but not, not trivial, not as easy, of course, as it looks in this simple example, much, much more complicated. Yep. For the people that have successfully um, utilized this, what was the solution to the libraries? Do you just not use them? Do you go in and just edit the code in the library? I and mean, how do you get the ebooks out? They don't. Just go to Sometimes the eval is just like, you're in place of like, a two-line switch statement, so it's just being really easy. The eval, eval, boolean expression, true or false? Yeah, sometimes it's stuff like that. So, you know, if you can do that and you can upstream it, then you're helping everyone else because they want to counter the same problem next time they use that library. And the other ones that are like, you, can't, you probably don't want to just go and like, mess with the actual Yeah, and some things like Facebook like buttons and stuff uh, use like the inline uh, event handlers for like, like a JavaScript URI and the link or something. Those were, those were our pain point for us. And for those, we just talk to Facebook and like, mm -hmm. Did they respond? I think, did did I they think, fix it? Yeah, I think it's clean now. Thank you. Uh, another thing uh, is that a lot of sites now want to have to have performance gain by inlining the first batch of user data in the first page. So, for instance, it would be Twitter. You go there and you want your first 50 tweets to be inline in the page instead of fetching those to mm -hmm. separate page at small. And you do that by regular dynamic HTML. And the trick you can do there is to inline it as JSON in a hidden div instead of in a script tag. And then in your file-based JavaScript, you just go to JSON parse and it's on top of that. Okay. So basically, it's obviously like CSP is changing slightly, and maybe majorly the way we're writing web apps slowly. But yeah, I think you had questions. So, yeah. Oh, I, I, the um, the report uh, handler um, for CSP. Uh, like I, obviously, you can build that yourself. It seems like a pretty simple format. But are there any like uh, server solutions or libraries that you know of that um, you recommend as like like just get this thing up and running within like a couple hours? 
Ask her. Yeah. I'll be talking about report handling at tomorrow morning. So if you guys are more interested about that, I'll talk about Ask her and some libraries that can help. Him. Some libraries that'll help you install the CSPF on sites. So tomorrow morning, Ask her. So tomorrow, 10:30 or something. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning, uh, Sir will be talking about one of the free tools, Ask her, that will help you with that. Definitely. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.